everyone. So good to see everyone this morning. Hello, my name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. And for everyone that's home, braving the uh, elements, we want to welcome everybody. Can you guys do me a big, big favor and let everyone know it's warm in here and it feels good? Come on, nice and loud. We, uh, we're beginning a new series today called It's Complicated. And uh, how many of you know people that are complicated? Don't look around too much. Yeah, I think all of us know people that are complicated. And so we're going to be starting a new series today, a four-week series about relationships. And, and I would say that some of the most rewarding things that we have in our lives is relationships. And some of the most painful things we have in our lives is relationships. And so how to relate to each other is so important. The Bible has a lot to say about relationships. In fact, the Bible is all about relationships between God and us. And so we're going to get to that in a few moments, but I just want to encourage everybody to remind everyone that next week, Grow Track Step 1 is going to be at 1 o'clock. And if you've been coming to this church for a period of time, want to find out more about Cornerstone Church, we'll serve you a lunch, no pressure, no, uh, no hassle guarantee. We're going to explain what Cornerstone believes and all that. That's next week. Love to have you come for that. Also, we're continuing with prayer on Fridays from 6.30 to 7.30 a.m. here and live as well, okay? So let's get to our series called It's complicated, and what are we supposed to do? If someone ever says to you, I'm in a relationship, it's complicated, that means there's problems. Uh, it doesn't have to be complicated. We make some things, so we, often what we do is we make the most simple things complicated, and the most complicated things that are not supposed to be simple. And so what are we supposed to do with these types of things? Well, sin complicates your life, and God's ways simplify your life. It really does. If you have complication in your life, chances are there's sin. Now, what does sin mean? Sin, hamartio, which simply means missing the mark. So if I take an arrow and I look at a target and I shoot at it and I miss it and I hit somebody else, that's missing the mark. And so what all sin means is missing the mark. Now, if you continually miss the mark, what happens? It is a malfunction. And what happens as a result of that? It's almost like a, a check engine light on your car. Uh, I remember having one in my car. It said service engine, you know, the check engine light came on. I don't know what to do. All I learned that if I go to the dealership, it's $2,000. If I go to Pep Boys, it's free. So I go to Pep Boys. Found out the code. The code is there's something wrong with my engine. One of the sensors is off. As a result of that, I'm burning too rich. And if I don't take care of it, I'm going to burn out my Cadillac converter. You know, if you know what a catalytic converter is, it's expensive, like a couple grand. So I had to fix it because there was a problem. There was an error. There was sin in my engine. And listen, everybody, when you and I miss the mark, what happens is it hurts us. And so that's the reason God doesn't like sin, not because he wants to take away our fun. Sin doesn't mean you're not having fun when you're supposed to. Sin is missing the mark. That's all it means. So sin complicates and breaks apart relationships while God's ways simplify your life. And so if you're in a complicated relationship, chances are there's sin all over the place. We want to eliminate that, right? Jesus makes life extremely simple. And so the premise of this entire series is built upon this, that God's ways are simple. Sin complicates. And so I want to go ahead and get, bring your attention to one of the most simple things in the world. If you read this, you're like, hey, I know that. Yeah, well, you and I may know it, but are we living it? You see, some of the deepest things in life is not intellectual deepness. The deepest things in life is actually doing something that we know. You can know about the ocean. You can talk about the ocean. You can explain the chemical compounds of the ocean. You can talk about coral reefs and all that. And you can sit there all day long, and you can, you can talk all about it, or you can get a snorkeler on, and you can jump into it and enjoy it. Which one really knows it? The one that's involved with it. And so God wants us not just to know him. He wants to know about him. And so in Matthew 23, 37, this is what Jesus said. When someone said, what's the greatest command? He said this. You shall love... The Lord your God with all your heart. Now, the word love is agape, which means without strings, okay? How many of you like to have somebody that would love you just for you instead of trying to get something out of you? you ever go to a store and they're real nice to you? Like, they must be on commission. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
all your soul and all your mind. In other words, with everything you are, you're supposed to love God. Why? Because we're designed to be loved by God, and we're designed to love God. That's our design. You go against your design, you break what's been there. So the Bible says, um, this is the greatest and first commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Here's the second one where we're getting to relationships. It's all about God. It's about us, right? And the second is like it. You shall love agape, agape, your neighbor as yourself. Now, we're going to break this down a little bit more. So if you don't love your neighbor, then chances are you don't love yourself. You see, the only way you and I can have good marriages, good relationships, whatever you want to do, is you have to first be loved by God. When you're loved by God, it gets you security. When you're loved by God and you know God loves you and you love him back, what happens is you are a whole person. You're not broken. You're not hurt. Hurt people hurt people. And so what happens is the most important thing we can do in any relationship to simplify is very simple. To love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But you can't love your neighbor if you don't love you. A lot of people don't love themselves. In fact, a lot of people get sick and tired of themselves and begin to hate themselves. And as a result of hating themselves, rather than hate themselves or hating God, let me hate you instead because it feels better to hate you than to hate myself. And some of the most angry people in the world are people that do not feel loved by God and do not like themselves. So when someone's nasty to you and you can't figure out reason why, probably is something that's going on with themselves. So what do we do about this? Well, this whole relationship is to demystify and, and uncomplicate our lives and make it simple. My friends, if we would do this, all relationships would change. So what we're going to do is look at this and change how we deal with each other based upon that. All right, so this is what we're talking about today. I like what C.S. Lewis says. Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. When you find Christ is your satisfaction. No one can make me happy. God is the ultimate one from happy. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from him. All right, so we got to understand that. So this whole series is about that. Uh, let me tell you a little story. When I was 10 years old, I used to live in Mineola, New York. That was a little while ago, everybody, back in the 1870s. Anyhow, I used to live in Mineola, New York, which is a suburb of New York City, about 25 minutes from Manhattan, or so, 30 minutes. And in the summer, uh, what I used to do at 10 years old, I used to get my banana seat bike with the three-speed, right? And I would disappear about 8 in the morning. My parents had no idea where I was all day long. And so did the rest of the neighborhood kids. If they would all be arrested in today's world, they would be arrested for abandonment of children. But my parents didn't care where I was. I mean, I no cell phones, no pagers, nothing. And my parents had no idea where I was. And I'm still trying to get over it now. No, but they had no idea where I was. When I used to go to many other pools, so I would go to many other pool, and I had my backpack on. My friends were with me. They're, they're going to get in the pool. I was like, well, i got to hurry up. So I, you know, I'm, get dressed and put on my swimming trunks, and I walk out of the dressing room, and I'm walking around, and everyone's looking at me kind of weird. They're like, I'm like, what's everyone's problem, man? What the heck's going on, everybody? I keep walking around. thought nothing of it. I dive into the pool, and my bathing suit comes off. <laughs> And I'm naked as a jaybird, okay? And I'm like, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. I was 10 years old, mind you. Okay, thank God. Okay, so anyhow, I, I, I grab, I said, where's my trunks? And I found out it wasn't swimming trunks. It was the fruit of the loom. <laughs> it was my BVDs. I, I, in other words, I left the locker room not with my trunks on, but with my underwear. So no wonder everyone was looking crazy at me. I was dressed funny. So I kept trying to, I tried to flag, say, hey, can you do me a favor? I don't have my own. The guy laughed at me, picked me up in front of the whole pool and, show, and showcased me. Hallelujah. I'm still going for counseling about that right now today. <laughs> then finally, I grabbed one of my friends and they gave me a towel and I get out of there. Well, what happened? I was, I was naked. I wasn't dressed appropriately. I felt insecure and I had to find covering. Well, this is what it's all about. You see, you are dressed. How you are dressed affects every area of your relationships. And today we're talking about being dressed appropriately. This is not a legalism thing about what you can wear, what you cannot wear. This goes a lot deeper than that. How you dress affects your life. The question is, how are you and I clothing ourselves? That affects everything. In fact, your relationships are based upon how you dress. Now, we're going to be handing out gift certificates 
to American Eagle. No, we're not going to do that afterwards, okay, everybody? We're not going to do that. Or Nordstrom's, okay? If that's the case, I'll take that. But no, that's not what we're talking about. How you dress, how you are dressed affects every area of your life. We all have clothing malfunctions. <laughs> do you remember the Super Bowl that one year? I'm not going to mention, okay? There was a malfunction, and that became a new word. Now it's like, oh, I had a, I had a, uh, I had a clothing malfunction. So uh, that, that's what's going on here. Well, I had a big malfunction in that pool that one day. Well, what do we do when we're not clothed correctly? How do we clothe ourselves correctly? The Bible talks about it. I'm going to go back to the first clothing problem. The first clothing malfunction happened in Genesis, the very beginning of all relationships. If you want to find out the genesis of relationships, go to Genesis. And in Genesis, we see the story of Adam and Eve, our first parents, the prototypes of what you and I were to become or are to become. And so now we're talking about this. God basically said this to them. Listen, you can have any tree you want, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you're going to be banished from this place, okay? I don't have time to break it all down, but that's what the story is. So now we go into, uh, now we go into the story. Now, now, the serpent was more crafty or intelligent or smart than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? You see, that's the first thing the enemy always does. He has you question God's word and God's motives. Is it really true that God said that? So they began to question that. The next thing happens is this. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to her, you will not surely die, which he was correct. Ultimately, he was correct. They would not die right then. He was kind of twisting the truth. You see what happens, everybody? The greatest lie has the greatest amount of truth in it. So be very careful. Two plus two equals four. Uh -huh. So four plus six equals 25. Uh-huh. See, people do that all the time. They'll take a truth, and then they'll put a lie in there and try to fool you, and that's what the enemy did. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, which is true, and you will be like God, which is sort of true, knowing good and evil. So what he was saying was, was, was twisted truth. Have you noticed there's a lot of twisted things going on in our culture today? A lot of twisted truths that are not truth at all, but they're lies, and they're very inceptive, and they cause all kinds of problems. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye, hey, this looks good, man. This looks good. Uh, and, and by the way, what fruit did she eat? Nope. No, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. The Bible says it's not an apple. It was not an orange. It was not kiwi. Okay, we don't know what the fruit was. The fruit was a decision that they made, but the fruit represented a tree. Which, what did it mean? What, what, what kind of fruit was it? We're not quite sure. It was not an apple, by the way. And by the way, this is not an Adam's apple. This is called a voice box from a man. Thank you very much. <laughs> so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was uh, desired to be made one wise, right? Well, I mean, I want to be like God. I want to know what God wants. I want to make my own decisions. I want to be a responsible person. All good things. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her knucklehead husband who was with her. Now, what did the guy do? Have you noticed guys don't care where they eat? I'm the same way. I'm driving the car. What do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to go? So here he is, Adam. I don't know. What do you want? How about this? All right. <laughs> so instead of being the leader of the house, what does the man do? He abrogates his authority and doesn't, doesn't bring correction to his wife. He knows better, and what does he do? He joins in with it. So that's what begins to happen. And they ate, and the eyes of both of them were opened immediately, and they knew they were naked. Naked. They knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. No. So they basically got a bunch of leaves, and they said, okay, we got to do something about this. So they got some gaffing tape, and they began to make... A line cloth, all right? So they started making these things. They put them together, and the next thing you know, they... I'm not going to do it. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. I'm not going to do it. This is a mixed crowd. Uh, but anyhow, that's what they did. They, they, they tried to cover themselves up, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves line cloths, 
and they heard the Son of God walking in the cool of the day. And man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of God. Now, why did they hide themselves? Because they realized they were naked. Something was lost. Something they were clothed with was gone. I thought they were naked. Yeah, they were naked and unashamed. They had nothing to hide. They were, they were just out there. Nothing to fear. But now they realize something was missing. They foregoed the presence of God. And they chose to go to the presence of their own wisdom and their own knowledge. And they were naked and they knew it and they were afraid. My friends, fear happens when God's out of the equation. Because this is part of the problem. So they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Have we done the same? We're not dressing up in God, so we hide in the trees of our work, the trees of church, the trees of doing good things, the trees of entertainment, the trees of golf, nothing wrong with golf, trees of cars, whatever it is. But we get around the trees, the trees of business. I don't want any quietness because if I'm quiet, I feel naked. I don't want to feel naked, so I'm going to hide in the trees of life. I'm going to hide in all the activity. I'm going to be busy all the time. If there's a moment of silence, I'm on my phone. I'm always doing something. I don't want to ever be alone. I don't want the silence. The silence is, is very scary, so let me stay around the trees. And that's what they were doing. They were around the trees. They were hiding in the trees. Are you and I hiding in the trees today? And that's what they were doing. They were hiding in the trees. And God was looking for them. You think God knew what happened? Absolutely knew what happened. So his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? I think God knows what's going on. Isn't it interesting? When we're, when we're doing something wrong, God's first looking for us. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is while we were, uh, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So basically the situation is God was looking for them. And no matter what you're going through, if you feel like you're ashamed, you feel like you're naked, you feel like you've gone too far, God is looking for for you. He wants to clothe you. He wants to help you. So what happened is I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The first cover up wasn't Watergate. We're all covering up stuff all the time. We have secret sins. If someone really knew, imagine if you will, imagine if you will that if next week we, we left, Elon Musk gave us a a uh, device to put on our heads, and <laughs> a <Nornet. laughs> and we had that. We went home for the week, and basically, what's going to happen is gonna, everything you thought about was going to be was going to be recorded on this device. Okay, and then next week we're going to invite everyone that you said something about or thought something about, and we're going to put it in the projector. We're going to put it in this big screen. How many of you would come to church next week? <laughs> right? None of us, right? The things we think and the things we do, we're ashamed of it. And so we have this, this thing in us. It's called the sin nature. And we're trying to clothe ourselves and trying to not to be cold, right? But the Lord God called man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I hid myself because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? So when you and I choose to do it our own way, what we're doing is, we're saying, I don't want God's covering anymore. And they lost God's presence. They were covered in his presence. They were covered with his truth. It was a clothing on him. My friends, it is a comfort to do things God's way. God's way is work. God's way, is, you're designed by God for God. And when you do things God's way, it helps. When you choose to do things your way, you break the manufacturer's design. You're designed to be with God. You take God away, it's not going to work. It's going to be temporary, and that's exactly what happened. Have you eaten the tree and the knowledge of good and evil? And the man said, the woman you gave, he's blaming God now. You know, what happens is when you sin, you hide, and then you blame other people. You know, I, I'm convinced what's going on right now in our culture. Have you noticed how everyone's blaming everyone for everything else? i got to find someone to blame. You know why, everybody? I'll tell you the reason why. I think a lot of us feel naked today in our culture. We feel powerless based upon what's happened the last 22, 23 months. It doesn't feel good to be fearful, right? Who wants to be fearful? No one wants to be fearful. But it feels better to be angry than fearful. Because when you have anger, you have a sense of power or control. 
When you're fearful, you have nothing. So what are we doing? We're fearful. We're letting the enemy whisper in our ear. And we, those people, there, they're there. And we try to find somebody else, the source of all of our problem, and we make a caricature of these different people that we don't like, different than us. This is why we're fighting over stupidity is because we're fearful as a culture. Instead of trying to clothe yourself on politics or ideologies, why don't we clothe ourselves with God Almighty? But we don't do that. We do the temporary instead. So the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit. See, he, he abrogated his authority. He abrogated the responsibility. He should have said, you know, it was my fault. I was there the whole time. But he, what did he do? He blamed somebody else. Why? I don't want to feel naked with, with being the one because of it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. So the man blamed the woman. The woman blamed the serpent. And the serpent had no leg to stand on. So this is what happens all the time. So they felt naked. Let me tell you, when you do something out of God's will, you feel naked. Something's missing. You know what I'm talking about, everybody? I've been exposed. What would happen if someone had your internet browser history? Would you be embarrassed? That's an example of what can begin to happen. So, and the Lord God, check this out, made for Adam and Eve, for his wife, made Adam for his wife garments of skins and clothe them. So what did God do? God clothed them with what? An animal, a sacrifice. There had to be a shedding of blood for sin. And so God gave them clothing to cover their nakedness. And by the way, this, this covering, the blood covering, happened throughout Israel's history where they would they sacrifice animals unto the Lord for the forgiveness of sins, right? Remember that? They've done that all their lives. And so they covered themselves in the blood of the Lamb. And then one time when Jesus came later on, his cousin, John the Baptist, says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So there had to be a blood sacrifice, and they put the skins on to cover their nakedness. So Adam and Eve realized they were naked. What did they do? They were no longer clothed with God, so they had to find substitutes to cover themselves. I wonder, what substitute are we using? Are we using church? Are we using religion? Are we using uh, entertainment? Are we trying to fill ourselves? I'm trying to cover myself with these leaves. I'm going to try to be the best person I can become. And maybe you and I will, wow, that person has their act together. That person's a great person. They have a great job. And we can get these leaves and cover ourselves. There's nothing wrong with golf. There's nothing wrong with going to school. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with having a good retirement. There's nothing wrong with making the most of your life. There's nothing wrong with that. But is that what you're covering your life with? Is it the leaves? And this is what we begin to do. The problem with leaves are, leaves decompose. Leaves are not real coverings. We're not designed for that. So, they were no longer clothed with God. <laughs> they began to blame others. You know you're naked when you start blaming other people. When you're naked, you start blaming everyone else for your troubles. That's what begins to happen. Now, if we are not clothed with God's presence, we will cover up with leaves. And it can happen to all of us, everybody. In fact, there's a problem with leaves. I'll show you what's going to happen. The issue that complicates all of our relationships is that we want to be God. We want to have our own clothing. We want to do our own thing. Now, one time, Jesus, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, this is about 1,000 years later now, after all this, Jesus was on his way. He was hungry, and seeing the distance, a fig tree, and what do they hide themselves with, by everybody? Adam and Eve hid themselves with fig leaves. Often Israel is, is talked about the fig tree. Often it is an illustration of a nation. So there's a fig leaves. So Jesus sees a fig tree. All right, he sees it. We'll continue to read. He was hungry, and seeing it in the distance, a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So what did he do? And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now imagine right now, I go outside to a lime and orchard or whatever, and I try to pick an apple from the tree, and there's no apple, and I take an ax and cut it down, saying, may it never come back again. Now he didn't take an ax. But he said his word, may there never be fruit from you again. It was not the season for figs. Why was Jesus cursing the fig tree? 
because it represented the leaves from the Garden of Eden. It represented the leaves of the Pharisees who were more interested in covering themselves with religion, with their own ideals, with their own opinions, with their own likes. I want to fill myself with leaves. I don't want God's way. I'm going to fill it with God's way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm God. I have leaves. The leaves of religion. The leaves of status. The leaves of being in the know, right? The leaves of whatever it could be. And they try to cover themselves with these leaves. And Jesus saw it. He went there. They rejected him. And he cursed the fig tree because it represented Israel. And they had the leaves, but they had no fruit. And they were covering themselves with religion. And they did not want the covering of Jesus. So they killed Jesus because they didn't want to be clothed with Jesus. They'd rather be clothed with being their own gods in the name of God. We do the same thing. I've seen churches split. Fracture over my leaves. I think it should be done this way. I've seen marriages do that and flip and go away because I want to be covered with my leaves, my understanding. This is my way. And God says, leave the leaves. Leave the leaves. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse is withered. We need to leave the leaves and cleave to God. We need to leave the leaves and cleave to God. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to leave the leaves and cleave to God. Let me explain. The Bible says this. Jesus was asked, what about marriage? He said, this is what happens. A man shall leave his mother and father. Can I hear an amen? They shall leave his mother and father and what? Cleave to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. You and I must be willing to leave our own understanding, our own design, our own desire. We must leave the elementary things of this earth and we must cleave and become one with Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about us being the bride of Christ. He's the groom. One day we'll be married. It will be consummated when he comes back. But right now we need to leave the leaves of these earthly things and clothe ourselves back with Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, what happened was he was the final skin covering that was necessary to cover us. And so we cover ourselves with Jesus. We're covered in his presence. We don't have to feel naked anymore. We don't have to try to blame other people for not having what we want. We need to leave the leaves. Where's your leaves? Is your leaves church? There's been times where I let the leaves be church. What happens at Cornerstone? Sometimes my leaves have been my family and where I've been compared to other people. I guess I'm doing pretty good. That's my leaves. I feel insecure. And if someone's doing better than I am on Instagram or Facebook, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. <laughs> right? Oh, she's probably wearing, she has Botox. That's why she didn't have crow's feet. <laughs> Those lips are not real. I mean, we sit there <laughs> And we sit there and we look at all these things, you know, you're sitting there at Taco Bell and someone's at a beautiful restaurant and you're like, ah, so, you know, we, we, we get jealous. Why? Because we want to be covered something differently. It's not about that, everybody. You can never be satisfied with leaves because leaves will never cover you like they're supposed to. These are not made to cover you. These are made to give fruit. These are made to give you shade in a day. They're not made to wear. And that's the problem with all these issues in our lives. In Matthew 27, 35, it says the following. It says, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. You realize when Jesus went to the cross, he was naked. They tore his clothes off, and he was naked on a cross. He's called the second Adam. Just like Adam was naked, Jesus was naked. The Bible says in the book of Genesis... By Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will have thorns and thistles. What did Jesus wear on his head? Thorns and thistles, a crown of thorns. So he became a curse for us that we could receive the blessings of God. Do you see that, everybody? He took us. He actually was the final 
sacrifice of the covering that we lost. Now, no longer do blood and goats have to cover us. We have the blood of Jesus, which is the garment he gives us. And Jesus took the curse. He was naked, so you never have to feel naked again and exposed. He was exposed, so you could be clothed. He was forsaken, so you never have to feel forsaken. He was despised, so you never have to be despised. Jesus experienced separation, anxiety. And God said, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus was forsaken, so you and I never have to be forsaken. Never do we have to cover ourselves with leaves that will leave. But a clothing from him. And so Jesus, think how he went back to the Garden of Eden, and he basically redid and undid the curse. And so you and I don't have to experience that anymore. If we're not clothed with God's presence, we will cover up with leaves. We need to clothe ourselves with Christ. Well, how on earth do you do that? How am I supposed to clothe myself with Christ? I'm going to fall here in a few moments. Excuse me, everybody. But put on the Lord Jesus. If someone says to me, oh, Eric, he's a put on. I hope they do. I hope I am a put on. I hope I'm putting on Christ. What we have to do is take off the garments of our own way, and we have to put on Christ. It's a choice you and I have to make. Take off the old. I mean, how many of you this morning uh, were wearing pajamas or whatever, and you changed your clothes to come to church? If you didn't, please don't tell us. But chances are, you, you got dressed, and, and, you, and you changed your clothes. Well, yesterday, during the snowstorm, uh, the end of the world, yesterday, we were fine because we had a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread. So it doesn't make a difference. What happens, if you, the Bible says in Hezekiah 3.18, you, if the end of the world comes, make sure you have a loaf of bread and a gallon of milk, and you'll be fine. There's no such thing, by the way. Okay. So I go out there, I had my, uh, you know, my sweatpants on when I wore to uh, the bed, and I put some slippers on with wool socks, and I'm out there with the snowblower. <laughs> I'm doing what my father used to do. My dad used to cut the lawn with a suit on. I'm like, my mother's like, what are you doing? And here I am, sitting out there doing this, and I'm getting cold. I mean, my hands started turning red. It started, I was like, I get this done, I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. So I'm here snow blowing, and I wasn't dressed appropriately, and the elements took me over, and I was in pain because it was cold. My, all right, my hands began to ache, and so I had to go back inside. And my wife put my hands, I mean, it really hurt bad. But you know what can happen to us, everybody? If we take out the clothing of God, we can experience spiritual hypothermia. You know, they've done studies about this. It's quite scary, and I've, I've read about people that have climbed Mount Everest. It's a fascinating, I even saw a movie about it, documentary. I find those movies fascinating. And so they climb Mount Everest, and what happens is sometimes if you start uh, experiencing, um, you start dying, and you start losing the ability to have heat, hypothermia kicks in. You know what begins to happen? First of all, you get cold, and you're shaking like this. Oh, it's cold, it's cold. Next thing you know, it starts having pain. And then the next stage of hyperthermia is you get sleepy. You say, oh, I just want to take a nap. I'm kind of tired. So what happens is if you don't clothe yourself, at first it's painful. When you first get involved with sin, when you first try to do something you know you shouldn't do, you, you're not clothed with God anymore, you do your own thing, at first it, it feels kind of uncomfortable. But as time goes on, you know, it's like smoking cigarettes. You, you, you're like, no one in their right mind want to smoke the first time, right? But you keep on doing it, you begin to like it. So all of a sudden, you're like, ah, this is painful. I said, wait a minute here. I don't, like hyperthermia, I don't feel it anymore. I, I, I feel kind of comfortable. And then you start sleeping. You know the final thing of hyperthermia, what happens? You wake up and you sense a great amount of heat. And people will strip off their clothes and become naked on a mountainside. They found hikers dead at Mount Everest naked because they tore off their clothes with the illusion. They became delusional and they thought they were hot and burning. So they took off their clothes. My friends, that's what sin will do. At first you're like, I can't, I can't be doing this. I, I, I shouldn't be talking to you this way. Oh, I know, oh, that's okay, that's okay. And we're just talking, we're just talking. And the next thing leads to another thing, another thing. The next thing you know, you start sleeping. Ah, this is no big deal, it doesn't bother me anymore. And then you fall asleep to the things of God. And until the final comes, you basically are, die from spiritual hypothermia because you're not dressed with the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to be dressed with him. We have to put on Christ you put on Christ by taking off yourself. 
You put on Christ by saying, I'm taking away my fig leaves. I'm getting rid of my leaves. I'm giving rid of him. And I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ. No longer am I going to let my identity be wrapped up in things that I produce of this earth. No longer am I going to let the things of this earth to I'm going to find my identity in Christ Jesus. Listen, everybody. When you know you are loved by God and you love God, who cares what anyone thinks? And then in a wonderful place to be, that's putting on the God. So, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Have you put on Christ? I'm asking you a question today. I'm asking you a question. If you're at home in a kitchen or you're in the packed porch or wherever you're located right now, or have you put on Christ? Yeah, God sees you even where on your little phone. Have you put on Christ? That's the question, everybody. Have you put on Christ? Today's the day of salvation, everybody. Today's the day to get right with Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. We're not done yet, so please don't no one leave yet. We have a little bit more to go. But let me ask you a question. If you were to die today, we've asked this question every week. And God were to say to you, why should I let you in? What would you say? If you say, well, I'm a pretty good person compared to other people, that doesn't cut it. There's only one way God will accept you. Are you clothed with Jesus Christ? Otherwise, there's no passing through. It's like putting an asbestos suit on where someone could walk through the fire because they're covered. Are you covered in Christ Jesus? And what it needs to happen is several things. Number one, you must believe he is the son of God. Number two, he died and rose again from the dead. And that's not good enough. There's one more step. You have to be willing not to be God and say, I am no longer God. God is God, and I choose to submit myself to him. If that's you today, if you've walked away, and, and maybe you still serve God, but you've walked away, and you know you're not right with God, I want to pray for you today. Maybe, maybe you've never given your life to Christ, so I just know better how to pray. Let's be real today. Anyone say, that's me today. I want to give my life to Christ the first time, or I want to renew my commitment. Anyone this morning? Anyone on the line? Okay, let's pray this prayer. Pray it with your heart and your mind. It's the prayer of faith. Lord Jesus, that's right, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I choose to turn away from what I know is wrong. And today, I step down from being in charge of my life. Lord, take my life. It is yours in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we believe you became born again in the front pocket. We're not done. We have one more thing to talk about today, but I want to do this first. There's a card. You want to pull it out, and you can put it in there. I made a decision today. Can you just go ahead and take a moment to do that? Or if you're online, you can text or do it here. You can take your phone, and you can text uh, the 860 499-4888 that's 860-499-4888 and text believe and we'll give you the next steps okay we're not done there's something else I want to bring to your attention likewise you who are younger be subject to the elders clothe yourself all of you with humility see God wants us to clothe ourselves not with braggadocious things but to clothe ourselves with humility who's the most What's the definition of humility? Jesus. What's the definition of love? Jesus. What's the definition of truth? Jesus. All the utmost of all the virtues is Jesus. So when we clothe ourselves with humility, we're putting Christ on. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud, but give grace to the humble. You know, in the book of Zechariah, this was speaking to the church of that day. What happened was this. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing right next to him, accusing him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it not the brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua, which represents those that believe in Christ, Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. Are you 
with, with filthy garments? Have you done things? Are you involved with things that, you, frankly, you should not be involved with? Are you filthy in your, in your conduct? Are you filthy with unforgiveness? Are you filthy, filthy with jealousy? Are you filthy with hatred? With filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. So he took the filthy garments on, off and put on God. God wants us to take off the filthy garments that we've allowed and we put up with. Some of us are put up with stuff too long. Some of you are in a relationship right now. Maybe you're married and you're, you hate your spouse. We're going to get into that later on. Maybe you, you, you're denying each other. You're not part of each other. You don't forgive each other. But you're just together for the kids only. Or you're just together because you know God hates divorce. But as far as you're concerned, you're divorced from your wife or your husband. How about we take off the pride? Take off the filthy garments and put on garments of praise. Put on garments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take off the filthy garments and put on the right thing. And I said to him, let us put a clean turban on his head. Maybe your mind is filthy. Maybe you're looking at the wrong things and involved with the wrong things. God says, get rid of those filthy things and put on the clean turban. God wants us to dress appropriately. See, you and I have a dressing problem. What are you and I dressed as? Every day, you and I have to make a decision what we're going to put on. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel said, I rebuke you, Satan. He's been pulled from the fire. When God forgives you, you are clean. It doesn't make a difference what your past was. If you were involved with all sorts of things in the past, it doesn't make a difference what you were part of. God says you're clean. You're clean. Don't let the enemy say, you've gone too far. You had that abortion. You had that divorce. You cheated on your this or the other. You can never know. God says, I've cleaned that person. I plucked him out of the fire. My clothing is is enough. Take off the, the garments of shame and put on God. Don't let the enemy come and try to collect from you something that Jesus has paid for. He's paid for you if you've given your life to him. Don't be put in shame. Yeah, but I knew better. Yeah, we all knew better. None of us are worthy. But Jesus forgives us. We don't have to walk around with this. The, in Jesus' name, I rebuke the enemy right now that would speak in people's minds that they've fallen too far. In Jesus' name, you're, you are enough, Christ. Jesus, what you did on the cross is enough. We break the power of the enemy right now over people's minds. Those that are watching at home as well, in Jesus' name, I command you, the enemy, to leave these people alone. We break strongholds of the mind. We cast down arguments that exalt itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that your blood is enough in Jesus' name. And I will no longer wear these filthy garments in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you willing to turn away from what you know is wrong? So, I don't have time to get into the rest of this, but the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation, there was a church that was lukewarm. Yeah, I go to church. Yeah, I go. I go at least once a month. You know, I watch a couple of times while I'm on Amazon buying things. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a part of it. You just check the box. For you say, I'm rich. I, I have prospered. I, I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. Isn't that how you feel good about that, everybody? So notice you're naked again? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich. And what? White garments. So that you may what? Clothe yourself. That's right, everybody. You and I have a responsibility to every day take off the grave clothes. Every day get rid of the bad clothes. And say, today I'm putting on Jesus Christ. I, 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 let me give you a little something to take home with you, okay? How about this week? This is real simple. When you get up in the morning and you change your clothes, can you just think about what we talked about today? And say, Father, I'm putting off these grave clothes of the evening and I'm putting on, I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God. My sins are forgiven. You are all that I need. I'm confident in you. I am loved by you. And say, Jesus, I give you this day. I choose to clothe myself in you. This is what we need to do, everybody. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I want to be known as the church of the put on. 
we go to the put on church <laughs> we put on Jesus Christ amen so let's pray father in Jesus name Lord all of us all of us all of us here all of us watching Lord, all of us often have an attire problem, Lord. We, we choose to be clothed with you. We clothe ourselves with these silly leaves, God. We want to leave the leaves and cleave to you, oh God. We want to choose on a daily basis to clothe ourselves with you, God. You are, Jesus, the final covering that we need. And we thank you that your love covers a multitude of sins. And so we choose to put you on today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, everybody, I just want to encourage you uh, this week. Can we do that, everybody? Seriously, when, you, when you're getting dressed and all that, and now if you wear your pajamas all day, it's not my problem, okay? <laughs> but seriously, just think about that. When you get dressed, Lord, I want to put you on. Just take two, two to th three to five minutes and dedicate the day to the Lord and clothe yourself. Amen? Amen. Hey, listen, before we, before we leave here today, I want to give you an opportunity to give. This is uh, something that actually the Bible tells us to do. The only place in the Word of God where it says to test God is in Malachi. It says, test me and see if not, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing you will not be able to contain it. doesn't mean you drive a Rolls Royce or a BMW. It doesn't mean that. What it simply means is that you say, God, everything I have is not mine anyhow. It's yours. And so, Father, I give back 10% in faith to you, trusting you'll take care of the rest. I'm telling you, everybody, you don't have to, but you get to in the New Testament. I've never seen God fail in this way. He will meet all of your needs in Christ Jesus. It is a promise. Listen, I have no apologies. It works. And I challenge you. If this is your place, if you go to another church, then tie to the other place. But if this is your local storehouse, then, tour, then, then tie to your local storehouse. And, and be generous and watch what God will do. So, Father, I pray you bless this offering today in Jesus' name. I thank you. Your word is not returned void. I bless you and I honor you today in Jesus' name. Bless every need that's needed here, Lord, that you would provide the tuition costs that people need. You would provide a way out, Lord, of debt in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you that you are the God that supplies all of our needs. Holy Spirit, if there are things that are not needs, help us to get rid of those things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, listen, everybody, I want to thank you. Uh, there's four different ways you can give. You can give the text 833-245-5608. You can go to cornerstonetreasure.com. There are boxes in the back. We can put your prayer cards there. And on Fridays, we do pray for prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests, please let us know. Let me just end with a benediction. May the Lord Jesus Christ fill you with his grace, with his power. And may the love of the Father give you confidence and may you walk clothed in power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.